Uh, my name is Kenneth Jones. I was born February the 7th, 1924, in Hagerstown. I joined the National Guard January the 7th, 1941. We trained stateside here for almost three years before going overseas. And then we trained pretty heavy in England for just about a solid year till we got to find out that we were going into France on D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. Uh, Company B, 115th Infantry Regiment, 28th Division. So we went into France on the 6th of June. We fought for 11 months and through France clear up to Germany. And we had four major battles that we fought in. And we had a terrific uh, amount of casualty. I myself was wounded twice. Most of all the men in the unit was wounded. And we had 12 of the original Hagerstown men killed. Now, can you uh, walk us through the D-Day invasion as you saw it? Well, uh, we were on the boats. We left Southampton, England, and went over to France. And when we come in to the shores, we would come in in landing crafts and hit the beaches. It was a second wave at about 9 o'clock on the uh, June the 6th. It was terrible. We couldn't move. We got stuck for a whole solid day on the beaches. We couldn't move a bit. The German artillery and their uh, bombs and the German, that kept us stranded. We, we were really in bad shape at a particular time until we got more reinforcements in. No. So, no. When you landed, you said you you uh, you got your first Purple Heart. Yeah, he was wounded for the first time. I was wounded on the beach. Now, what what time did you get wounded? Do you think? I'd say it was about ten o'clock or twelve a.m. in the morning. She was, was on the beach. About an hour after we were in. Okay. And what happened there? Well, I went back to the first aid station. I wasn't hardly, I wasn't wounded all that bad, but I spent a week there getting patched up, and I can only rejoin the outfit. Now, what kind of wounds did you have? I had an arm wound, a wound, a leg wound. Small arm side? Him. Some shrapnel. From a shell? Mm-hmm. The Germans had their 88 guns and they were, they were terrific. Boy, they, they, they think of really, really scare you. Now, uh, what happened to you then after the week of you know, rehabilitation from the medical station? And you joined we the troops? We rejoined them and we weren't too far in off the beach at the time, maybe about a mile or two. And we had to, we fought real heavy from there, clear till July the 18th when we went into St. Louis. And there's where we were really bogged down because they, the Germans held us down pretty good and the cousins were all so high there. <clears throat> And when we finally took St. Lo, we uh, went back for a week's rest and to train new recruits that come in, replace the ones that we were killed and wounded. And then we took off again up through Germany, on the other side of Germany, up into Percy, what they call Percy, France. And we got into an apple orchard there, and we got pretty heavy from mortar shells from the Germans and we got suffered again a lot of casualty and there was three of us from that bigger town that was wounded there in, in that field and that's we were had to go back to a first aid station and there we were transported by uh, ambulances back to the evacuating station and from there we picked up planes or boats whatever was handy going back into England to regular hospitals. Now when you was uh, 
when he was hit the second time now in France, he said, right? It was, uh, well, you know, what happened that day? Well, nothing really. It just went back to the, the, the aid station and laid there until the, the, the minutes punched you up. Then the ambulance come and took him back to the evac hospitals. And that was just another shell that got you again? Mm -hmm. And you, there we got patched up, laid there for a day or two until they could get us on transportation, uh, trans, uh, transportation out of uh, France back over to hospitals in England. And that was a three months hospital stay. And I would come back and rejoin the unit in the uh, latter part of November. And I've seen the rest of the war through. It was getting pretty well over with at that particular time. Did you see the masses of Germans surrender at near the end of the war in 45? I've seen a lot of Germans surrender. They were just coming in. We were up along the Elbe River, and they were coming across that river at night to surrender us because they didn't want the Russians to take them. They were scared to death of the Russians. They thought they'd have to kill them. So they took the, the, the rather uh, surrendered to the Americans. And we took in an awful lot of prisoners. I'm talking about the whole front of other divisions, plus the 29th. Now, how many soldiers are we talking? Hundreds or thousands? Thousands of them. Um, up there on the docks in uh, Bremerhaven, there must have been 10,000 of them laying all over the docks up there uh, waiting to be taken by the prisoner of war camps. They, were, we, they had people there guarding them. So, it was, like I say, coming towards the end of the war, we went in and occupied the German homes in Bremerhaven, and that's where we stayed until we got the news on May 8th, 1945, that Germany had surrendered. Now, uh, I want to go back a little bit to the story you told me earlier about your Bible in your pocket and you getting hit there. Would you mind telling that again for the camera? Well, yes. Uh, I didn't realize what type of a wound I had when the shell hit. We knew we could feel the sting. I knew my arm was injured, but I didn't know nothing about my chest until I got back to the aid station. And I was laying in the aid station there with my buddy, and I told him, I said, my, a lot of blood was coming down my arm. I said, I wonder when that medic's going to get in here. And when the medic came in, he looked at my field jacket and he seen the holes in it. And he opened it up and he seen my, all this material in there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> and he started pulling all the things out of my pocket. And he looked and he seen he did it when he seen the two pieces around in my chest. I didn't know it was it there. But after he checked me out. But do you think the shrapnel was slowed down by all the stuff in your pocket? Oh yeah. Yeah, but then I when I had that stuff in there, it tore up the sound powered phone and all a lot of the stuff things that I had inside there. I got a book back here I wanna show you it's the only thing I salvaged out of it is my uh some one small book is hanging up here. All right, sure. When I was released from the hospital to return back, and the first thing we had to do was to go for a refresher course, a school that had up in Belgium. I had to go to a non-com school there to freshen up on my job as a squad leader and after you did that that was about a two-week course and uh, they give you a diploma and 
ship show. So we went on down into Brussels, Belgium. We were supposed to catch a train there to go back up to the front line. Well, we got news that the Germans had bombed the, the railroad area there, knocked out a section of trap. So we had a delay of a week, a little better than a week. And so we just had nothing to do but just horse around in Belgium, which was good duty. We really enjoyed ourselves. And uh, then the, after the week was up, then we got on the trains and went back up into Germany and rejoined the unit. Now you rejoined with the Company B of the 115th? Yeah. Yeah, the same outfit the whole way through. And then when, you know, what, what time period is that? This was uh, the latter part of November of uh, 44, clear up until um, May the 8th when it ended, 45. Now, what, what was combat like for you as an individual? Well, I don't know. It's really hard to say. The, the biggest thing about a combat was that you had experience, well trained. You were trained in just about everything there was as far as fighting the Germans was concerned. And that was a big edge compared to the new recruits who were coming in, didn't have that extra training like we did before the war broke out. It meant a lot. And so, uh, like I say, that, uh, that, helped, that helped tremendously to get you through. Now, did you have the uh, mentality thinking that you were not going home, or did you think you was no, going to go No, I never thought that. I, I, I thought I was coming home. I was concerned a lot about my brother. Uh, he was fighting about, uh, he was behind me the whole during this fighting, and I figured, if I'm safe, I know he'll be safe. But his his was a complete accident, which I found out later on. That a German stray shell went back and hit between the trail legs of the their 105 howitzer and killed the whole crew. And it's the only cousin they had in the whole war. The cannon company he was in. Of the 115th Infantry, and he was on that crew. Yeah. It's sad, but it, it, it's the way it happened. Now, when you found that out, did you fear about your other brother then? Well, he was back in the hospital then, but uh, I seen him when I was back in England. In fact at my hospital. When I got packed up pretty good, I went to his hospital to see him, my brother Bill. And uh, we had, we were together for two, two, a couple of days. And he said, I'm going to be going back to combat. He said, they're putting me on limited assignment. I said, well, Bill, I'm going back up the front. So he wished me luck. I said, I'll be all right. I'll catch you stateside. And we'll when this thing's over, and it did, the way it came out. Now, is there any stories that you remember that would be funny, if you will, or a comical instant that might have happened? What, you, you, you say a funny story? Yeah. Well, there was, and this was in, in the fighting part of it. Those hedgerows over there, some of the times the Germans would take and haul out the hedgerow and keep the brush up on it and set machine guns in amongst that brush. And, uh, and uh, one day, this couple of boys from the first platoon were charging up over and going up over his hedge, the hedge, and he fell down through into his trench. It was under the, On the, the other camouflage. The and there was a German laying there with a rifle. And we used to have his name was McGonagall. Never forgot his name. 
He said, I took him prisoner. He said, boy, it just so happened. I got my, up and got my rifle on him before he'd get me. <laughs> just the dumb luck that he saved his own life. <laughs> but they didn't, they didn't shoot one another. But he got the drop on the German, he said. Oh, and a lot of funny things are just happened. <laughs> Now, uh, how did, how would you dig your own foxholes? You were saying about how the Germans, you know, dug the underneath and kind of hollowed out the hedgerow. Well, I'll tell you what, we didn't we didn't have too many hedgerows. We didn't. You want to recall? No, thank you. <coughs> I tell you what. Once we the most of the digging we did was was in the early part, and we couldn't move too much. And a lot of digging we had, to, we did, we, it wasn't all that much because we would get into uh, the big bomb craters. We could just go right into them and dig in the side of them, which, which was uh, a simple way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But very few times we had to start right on top of the ground and dig a foxhole. I'm sure that was convenient for you. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't have to do that too often. But once we got started, we were on the move pretty good. Mm -hmm. And you and when you when you got a break, you like to lay down and rest. You don't want to get into the shovel and carry it on. Now, did you uh, was you in on any of the fighting in the breast campaign? No, we didn't get down there. I was in all four of the major battles that was in all through the war. But, uh, uh, <coughs> not, we never got down in the breast. Not our outfit, anyway. <coughs> now, uh, how far inland were hedgerows? Would the hedgerows go the whole way through Normandy? Just about. Yeah. That's what you fall from one day to the next, one hedgerow to another. Mm -hmm. If you had a good day, you'd take two hedgerows in a day. Now, what was your thought on it? Did you like hedgerow fighting? I mean, it, given the you know that you had to fight, but did you see it as a more difficult task? A what? Fighting in a hedgerow. Hedgerow. I don't know. I didn't see any different in it. It was a lot of protection for you, too. It, it, it was tough fighting. But also, you could save it. A lot of guys were saved from artillery fire by shells landing on the other side of the hedgerow, and mm -hmm. the, the, the shrapnel couldn't get to you when up in the air. The worst, the worst you can run into is like we did there in that first in France in that apple orchard was tree burst. That just, then your shells come in, hit the top of those trees and then explode and just rain that trouble right down on you. Yeah. You're better off being out in the open where the shell hits the ground up like that all oh, shrapnel. The mortar shells that we fired, the three pounders, they had a little button on the end of the, the nose of the shell. And at least the little thing that they hit, they ignite them. Mm -hmm. It can be a dam that had a branch of a tree and it explode the shell. Now, did you ever have any close calls in combat? Other than being Hit by shrapnel by a couple of shells? Not to I can recall. No, there wasn't there wasn't much of that really to happen. It was all just a regular fighting. 
and they were too often called treats. If the casualties were heavy, the Germans and the Germans were called treats, and they'd come out, their medics, our medics, and take the, the wounded and the dead back off the field. Mm. Maybe take an hour or two, and then I didn't play them. I'm sure you enjoyed that hour or two. <laughs> Funny what that war can be had some funny terms to it. Yeah. Now what kind of weapon did you have? You was holding an M1 Grand the whole time? No, I carried a 45 pistol. I had a squad leader. And uh, when you're a mortar, mortar squad leader, you went on with a 45. You could carry a carbine too if you wanted to. But I, I didn't particularly, I was like a lot of other guys, the carbine was, wasn't much of a, a weapon in, in warfare. It, it, was a, it, was, it was light, it was handy, it was a good firing feed, but at least, at least a little dirt get in it can mess up the firing mechanism. It wouldn't be any good at all to you. The, the, the grand, the rifle, was one of the best weapons that Uncle Sam had over there in that war. So you use a mortarman then? Yeah, 60, 60 millimeter. What would be a typical assignment for a mortar then? Would you uh, do close combat support for infantry soldiers who are going in to take a town? You were, you were, uh, we had three mortar squads and three machine gun squads. And each one of us were connected to a the three rifle teams. In other words, we, we were fighting. Uh, over here, the first team, well, I'd take my squad over there and, and then to the rear of them to support them. Mm -hmm. What you used to call it in Uncle Sam's popping, uh, Uncle Sam, Sam watch pocket cannon is what they called the 60 mortar. It was an artillery piece, but it was small. But it, 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 it was very a very good weapon at the end of the war Found in the fields like that. But you had to watch yourself. You'd get in a firing position of the tune that you was working with, and you could, you'd allow maybe a dozen shells. You better pull out and have another position to go to. So it wouldn't be, it'd take long, the Germans would be back and be in what you want. They'd be zeroed in on you. Mm -hmm. They could pick you up. You'd get a lot of, a lot of damn trouble <coughs> from their weapons in that area where you were firing from. They yeah, just could do it all out there. Now, how far away were the Germans that you're firing upon? Well, in order for us to have any effect, that weapon fired 60 fires of a minimum of 75 yards to 1,095 yards. So, it wasn't all that much, uh, the arc and the firing of it was, I think it was 1,935 or 85 yards of that one. He had three ammo, uh, ammo bearers, and each guy carried six shells in a bag, a satchel over each. Probably his head dropped down on him. And those shells were gone, he'd have to call back to his supply and have him bring more ammunition up. You, you, you're using an awful lot of it. <coughs> now, how many times did you ever have to unholster your 45 and actually fire you know, at close range? Never. I used it to fire into going through some of the town that went to the homes. I'd kick open the door and maybe run off a couple rounds. I didn't see nothing. But if somebody's in there, it might have scared them out. It was the sound of it. For effect, then. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of them. collaborating French people, mm -hmm. collaborating with the Germans. They occupied France, you know, for four years. And women in particular. 
So what was your general feeling for the, the French people? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think much on it. I definitely didn't like the one that collaborated the German, sure German or men. And that you could just throw them right in as, as the enemy, too. <coughs> but the French people overall, I thought they were all right. I never seen a French soldier. I never seen a French soldier. So, uh, what was your job on D-Day as you landed on the beach, being a mortarman? I never you know, knew that. I thought you was infantry. So as you landed on the beach, did you actually have a weapon at that time? Yeah. Other than a forty-five. We had mortars, but we couldn't set them up and use them until we got in far enough that you know that you got enough. Uh, yeah. So your job, them. your job was pretty much to stay alive at that point. Yeah, more or less. Well, the guys that carried the ammo had guns, they could use them, they could help out the rifles and some great on that beach like that, but a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion. How close to the beach did your boat actually get? Got us right in. Took us in the dry landing. Some didn't. Some hit sandbars, got hooked up, mm -hmm. had to wait in. But it, it, it was a mess. You never know, you let, I could tell the story time and time again, but you never know unless you're there what it was like. You can visualize yeah. what, what, what it was like. But it, it's not the same. That's what I, I told people, just see that movie, Saving Private Line. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Yes, sir, I did. I told people, I said, that thing, the first 20 minutes of that movie, was as close to the actual thing as any movie I've ever seen. The, uh, the boats coming in, the scenes that they took there, and the bodies laying around, working around, the obstacles, mm -hmm. and the sound effects, it was all good. But the only thing that you don't get in the movie that you you get when you was actually there, the stink and the stench of the war. Yeah. It was warm as it was. It smelled dead bodies, everything. It's a hell of a mess. Now in the time of the hour that you were on the beach unharmed, did you make it to the wall? Did, you know, from the you know, where you landed to a, a safety zone? Yeah. Yeah, we got up there all right. I can tell you what few of us were left when we got there. Because they kept sending more troops in, so you had to keep moving as best as you could. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, we did, I'll tell you one thing, even the big generals could tell you, we're damn lucky we, we didn't get through back in that, that English Channel. We were very close to it. When we run into us, it's terrific. Opposition there in Omaha. Now, how far inland did you go to them? What, did you go a couple hundred feet or you know, a few yards? Well, uh, it wasn't much when you first landed. You didn't, you didn't get, you didn't even get a toehold for for a while, for the longest while. Yeah. You were a couple of days, and you could still look back and see the water. You now, just crawling and doing, crawling along as best you could. Lugging your equipment, what you had. A hell of a lot of them lost their things. What you did, though, you picked up the other guy who was killed, used his weapon or whatever. Mm -hmm. You do that yourself? No, no, I never have to. What were you doing at the time of the shell falling? Mm -hmm. What were you doing when the shell hit you? We were we were there at a meeting at the hedgerow uh, in in its apple. Apple Orchard, planning on what, how we were going to set up the, uh, for the, 
in the orchard that we knew we was going to have a pretty big day of fighting. Mm -hmm. And while we were talking it over, that's when they busted this orchard with a blast of artillery. So we didn't get a chance to do anything. Not us four, anyway. And there's more, I guess, later on, I don't know. What, what was your thoughts? What was going through your mind? Oh, everything. A lot of vision back home. Boy, some people don't realize what war is. It's hell. We look at one another and say, hey, man, we never thought it was going to be like this. Very, very fortunate. A lot of people don't realize how close we come to losing it. But they were scheduled to win on the, the D Day was supposed to be in the fifth. Mm -hmm. and bad weather set in. And we still had bad weather on the sixth, but they wouldn't they didn't they didn't turn back on that day. You couldn't see nothing that English channel about a seven mile seventeen mile stretch from the England over to France, you couldn't see a hard end. you couldn't see the water. Boats were so thick. Mm -hmm. You had good air cover though. Our planes were only in were coming in. And they blasted an awful lot, but boy it was tough to knock out those pillboxes. Boy, those things were really concreted in. They must have had fifteen foot of thickness. All concrete and steel. How long did it take you to be evacuated, England? Hmm? How long did it take to get you evacuated, England? No, from the time I got wounded to the aid station back to the evac and then on the plane. I guess it was about three weeks. There's so many. Those tents, those evacuating tents, and the, now they're about 10 miles back to the front. Just overloaded with casualties. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't have enough cops to even put the guys in. Some had the ones that could walk, they had them sitting on the ground or leaning up against something. So, where were you at on May the 8th? At the end of the war? Mm -hmm. At the end of the war then, you know, after you fought the whole war after D-Day, where did you find yourself at the end of the war? We were on Grumman in Germany. How long did it take you to go back home then? Well, the war ended May the 8th. June, the latter part of July, I got I shipped out. And I had to speak to the Latter, the latter part of July. Mm -hmm. I flew back. I flew Marseille from. They trucked us clear down through Germany and over through Brussels, and down through Belgium, and Holland, and France down to the French coast. There we picked up uh, planes. They used even uh, they even used the. Uh, the big uh, bomber planes to shuttle troops uh, guys back to the States. The B-17s and 24, the big bomber, they stripped them of all their armament. And I rode him one of them back. Was you in a B-17? Mm-hmm. In fact, I rode with, right up there with the pilot in the co-pilot seat. I said, I'm going to take a seat. There's 30 of us on the plane. I wasn't in charge, but uh, I told him, I said, hey, I said, who's sitting up there? We asked him about the mind. I said, do you mind if I? That was some experience. We flew, Mar we flew out of Marseille, France, in the B-17 in Casablanca, North Africa. That was our first leg. Mm -hmm. 
the engineer, we picked up a, what they called the C-54 Skymaster. Flew on that one, on into the Azores, Bermuda, and then down into Miami, Florida. Where'd you fly in the C-54? Mm -hmm. I bet you wasn't a co-pilot, were you? No. But you know what? When I get moves on that plane, uh, I looked up one time, here was the pilot and the co-pilot, back where we were at. And I asked the pilot, who the hell's flying this plane? He's just flying itself. I didn't know nothing about such a thing as an automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. I did at that, at that time. I didn't. Yeah. So this one area you went over there, they did the pilot told us, don't you gotta go worrying that it was air pockets. It's one such you know, that travel. It said we'll hit it and you'll know we hit it. And you just the plane did. And that damn plane felt like a bottom from out of it. Dropped about five hundred foot. And took off again. He don't worry about it. So they'll get back in the groove. Mm. But it gave you a good scare, though. <laughs> yeah. Robert Abe Fitz. Well, do you have any closing remarks about your service? No, I. Uh, I'm just like everybody else. I wouldn't take a million dollars for experience, and I wouldn't take a million to do it, go through again. <coughs> and I was proud to say that I served. Did you serve any after the war then? Yeah, I went back into guards for six years up here in Hagerstown. <coughs> served, I served six more years. I worked mostly with the recruiting of the of uh, new guys coming in, basic training for them. But then I got my fiat in one day. I could have stayed with my regular time. I had, I had 11 years. Nine more, I could have got a, a pension. Mm -hmm. So when did you officially retire out of the military? Uh, July the 30th. First, I think, it was right on July, June, July 31st, I think. Come back to the latter part of July, and I think we just separated down there at Fort Meade. I think the last of July. What year was that? 45. I got married in 46. I had seven children. Five boys and two girls. Well, thank you for your service, and thank you for the interview. Uh, you're welcome, pal.